Thank you all. Um, the, the, I felt the first panel went great. I'm really excited about this next one here. Uh, we've got uh, our second panel is Solar Energy's Illuminating Role in the Clean Energy Transition. Our moderator today is Danny Shingala, um, who is a JD MELP of 2013 and now the Chief Operating Officer of Ranger Power. Um, she has over a decade of experience in the renewable energy industry and previously served as general counsel of Ranger Power and Ranger Solar. Danny's worked extensively in renewable energy development, policy, energy regulation, and environmental law. Prior to joining Ranger Company, she worked in private practice where she represented renew renewable energy developers and utilities on a variety of regulatory, permitting, real estate, and transactional issues. Danny's a graduate of uh, UC San Diego, um, as well as Vermont Law and Graduate School. She's admitted in the states of California and Vermont, and uh, she's here today to moderate our next panel. So, Danny, over to you. Thanks, Dan. Um, quite, quite the intro. Um, it is good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here today. The panel today, uh, this next panel is focused on solar and its role in the clean energy transition. In particular, we're going to look at, is this mic okay, by the way? Can folks hear me? Okay. We're going to look at um, solar in the era of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and ways in which the legislation has impacted the deployment of solar across the country. On the panel today, we're joined with Trevor Laughlin, uh, MELP 2022, Policy and Regulatory Affairs Analyst for Standard Solar. Christopher Sapino, LLM 2013, Managing Senior Corporate Counsel at MISO, and Michael Gergen, Senior Strategic Advisor and Counsel for the Coalition for Green Capital. Um, as Dan mentioned, my name is Danielle Shingala, uh, JD Melp 2013, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Ranger Power. We are a utility scale renewable energy company. Uh, so while my company develops solar, wind, and storage projects across the U.S., the majority of our work to date has been on utility-scale solar in the Midwest. Um, we have over 10 gigawatts under active development, and since we were founded in 2017, we've um, executed nearly three gigawatts of offtake agreements, have taken over a gigawatt into construction, uh, and by the end of this year, we'll have 800 megawatts in commercial operation. Um, so to start things off today, I think most of us in this room have a general familiarity with the IRA, uh, but wanted to highlight some of the ways in which the IRA impacts solar development specifically. Um, and, like, and likewise, some of the challenges we face in the solar industry in the wake of the IRA. I'll share a couple of thoughts from the utility scale perspective, uh, but we have Trevor joining us today who will address the, the community solar and commercial solar perspective. Um, so just high level, everyone knows IRA was landmark clean energy legislation uh, passed last year in August of 2022. With respect to solar, there's a couple of key provisions that we are thinking a lot about in the solar industry. One of them, um, which was talked a lot about on the earlier panel with respect to uh, offshore wind, is for the first time ever, there is now a solar production tax credit. Um, and I should caveat all this, I'm not a tax attorney and not a tax expert, but I will do my best. Um, but this is, you know, this is a, a new development for, for solar um, and sort of opens up the tax equity markets in an interesting way um, and makes us sort of look at our financial stacks in a way that we, we haven't been able to before. Um, the IRA also extended the ITC for an additional 10 years. Um, never in the industry have we had such a long runway where we can capture sort of full ITC, as we say, uh, which would be a 30% ITC. And we can do so as long as projects um, are meeting the prevailing wage and apprenticeship, apprenticeship requirements um, that the, the law specifies. Um, the IRA also created these bonus credit opportunities. So this is, again, a new sort of category of tax credit for solar. Uh, there are several of these. Brownfield, energy community, domestic content are a few that we're you know, looking at from the utility scale perspective. And in particular, for utility scale, we're looking at these energy community and domestic content qualification categories. Energy community, it's basically a question about how and where you're citing your project, a couple different ways to meet those qualifications. Um, and then domestic content, which, you know, 
the prior panel talked a lot about you know clarity under the IRA. This is an area that we're still looking for clarity um, from Treasury on what exactly this means and how is it applied. Um, but domestic content is essentially this sort of um, intent to bring more manufacturing into the U.S. and accordingly projects can get an additional 10% ITC if they meet these domestic content qualifications. Um, the IRA also changed how we can monetize tax credits as a solar project. Um, so we created two new ways. One is this direct pay option, which essentially allows tax exempt entities um, to take advantage and monetize tax credits uh, through basically a, a direct refundability process. There's also an ability to transfer tax credits. So this is also a new sort of um, mechanism created by the IRA for entities that are not tax exempt. Um, we can transfer a portion or all of our tax credits um, to an unrelated entity. So it's sort of a different way to, to monetize these tax credits. Um, these are interesting. They're novel. They're starting to be done, particularly the transferability pieces, um, and sort of open up um, the market of who can participate in tax equity for a solar project. Um, so. The IRA, there's lots to unpack. Um, as again, the prior panel noted, there's tons of, of pieces in here and, and solar is just a small piece of, of this legislation. Um, but it's very exciting. It's the most aggressive pro-solar legislation to be passed at a federal level. And certainly as a, a renewable energy company, you know, we've been very um, sort of encouraged and motivated um, to work in this new sort of era created under the IRA. Um, that doesn't mean, however, the industry doesn't have its challenges. So I'll hit on a few. I know Trevor's going to touch on some more, um, but there are still several challenges that we're facing. One is just pressure on the industry. Um, with so much interest in the industry, uh, there's increased competition across the board. From an employment standpoint, there's competition for, for developers uh, and for folks to actually do this work. Um, there's also competition for sites, particularly these high value sites, the ones we talked about with the energy community. Um, this is also resulting in higher land costs. So more competition for these sort of target sites, we're seeing land prices increase for what a development company has to pay to lease or buy land for a solar or wind project. Um, we have permitting challenges. Uh, I could talk for four days about the permitting challenges we face, uh, and Trevor's gonna touch on that more, but um, there are you know, increased, there's increased opposition to solar, particularly as the, the technology becomes um, more present in, in the environment. Um, it's been around a little bit longer now. Folks are um, sort of learning the, the playbook of how to oppose a solar project in the same way they did for wind um, in preceding years. We also have pressure on, on EPCs. So these are the en engineering procurement and construction contractors that, that build these projects. There's a higher demand. These EPCs can be more selective and they also cost more. So trying to um, bring EPCs to a project has become more challenging, particularly if you're in areas of the country that are not the Southwest or the Southeast. So harder areas of the country to build, like New England, um, it's, it's harder to attract EPCs to those projects. Um, I'll be quick on the financing concerns. The prior panel hit on this too. Interest rates uh, are really challenging for the industry. Solar projects require a lot of significant upfront capital uh, to build. Um, and this is largely funded by debt. So higher interest rates make it more costly to borrow um, and it significantly increase the cost of a project. We're also seeing credit downgrades across the market. Um, again, results in higher bar uh, borrowing costs um, and just less folks to, to borrow this money from. Uh, we're also seeing changes in the tax equity market. Even though there's a couple new ways to monetize tax credits, um, we are generally seeing less tax tax equity appetite, um, which is an important um, sort of financing um, stream for these projects. Um, and then we have sort of interesting issues created by the IRA. So I mentioned before the ability to transfer a tax credit. It's a great way to sort of monetize the tax credit. Um, however, when you work with transferability, the buyer is only buying the tax credit uh, versus in traditional tax equity. Uh, the tax equity partner could also monetize things like depreciation. So there's a little bit of a, a hole left in the capital structure in our projects. Um, procurement timelines are a challenge. Uh, prior panel hit on this as well, but uh, it is taking longer to get the equipment we need. Um, we're seeing things like um, main power transformers to be 2x the time for them to be delivered on site, causing major issues in terms of uh, when we can commit to bring projects online. 
Uh, Chris will speak to this more, but uh, the interconnection queues are also really challenging. So utility scale, we're interconnecting to the high voltage transmission system and working with organizations like MISO um, to interconnect our projects. Uh, the queues are full, the studies are delayed, um, and that's significantly impacting project timelines, particularly when you layer on a more complex permitting environment, trying to get those right um, in terms of how to make the investments on these projects has become challenging. Um, we're also seeing transmission owners have the same procurement challenges we, ha we have. So breakers are taking longer uh, to be delivered, causing uh, TOs to have to amend generation interconnection agreements uh, in order to bring those projects um, in line with more realistic uh, equipment timelines. Um, and I won't touch much on this because I know Trevor's going to hit it, but there's also challenges with how do we implement the IRA. I think um, similar to the, the greed hydrogen folks after the uh, IRA was passed last August, we're like, great, as a development company, let's go. Where do we go? Uh, so over the last year, we've had a lot of certainty over um, what is an energy community? How is it defined? What does that mean? Um, what does prevailing wage mean? What do the apprenticeship requirements look like? Um, so we've had clarity uh, slowly over the last year. I think we feel OK about it. Something like prevailing wage, it's going to cost more, but we understand it and we can plan for it. Domestic content is still an area where we're, we're trying to understand what that means and how do we meaningfully um, integrate that into a business strategy. Um, so lots of pieces to still connect with respect to the implementation of the IRA. Um, so with that 30,000 foot overview, I will stop and I'll turn it over to the real experts, um, share their thoughts. And we'll start first with Trevor Laughlin. Yeah, thank you. And um, first <laughs> off, I want to say thank you to uh, Vermont Law and Graduate School, Kevin Jones and the IE, oh, the IE for inviting me to speak today. Um, just over a year ago, I was uh, wrapping up my time at the Vermont Law School. Um, so it's pretty full circle to be up here speaking amongst um, you know, industry professionals about the uh, such an important uh, piece of legislation. Um, but as Danny mentioned, um, today I am the Policy and Regulatory Affairs Analyst for Standard Solar. There we go. One more. There we go. Awesome. Yeah, Standard Solar um, was uh, founded in 2005. Uh, and we were recently acquired by Brookfield Renewable. If anyone's not familiar with Brookfield Renewable, uh, they are the second largest uh, alternative asset owner in the world. Um, so it's a pretty big deal. Uh, we're very excited. Um, and it comes with you know, a lot of challenges in the transition uh, from the acquisition, but you know, we're really excited for the future. Um, Standard Solar is, is a, um, really a one-stop shop when it comes to solar. Um, we are a project developer, financier, um, and long-term owner and operator. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, headquartered in Rockfield, Maryland, um, my role at Standard Solar is to really lead the policy department. Um, I like to say I lead the policy team. I'm a policy team of one. Um, but it's, it's, it's a very fun, fun battle and a very fun time to be in the industry. Um, my role as the policy lead is really to communicate with the different departments, um, whether that's you know, the business development team, the transactions team, um, on the different you know, state programs and state rules, um, you know, abiding by the correct tariffs and whatnot, as well as um, the, the engineering teams as, as well. Um, you know, when there's a, a certain bill that we're interested in, it's my, it's my duty to really advocate on behalf of that bill. Um, and the same goes um, for the regulatory side, when there's an important docu docket um, that we want to participate in. It's my, my duty to, uh, to you know, submit a, a public comment in that. Um, but going into the, to the main point of the presentation, the, the IRA, um, uh, Senator Swilpern as well, we're, you know, in, 20, in over 20 states as well. We have over uh, 500 megawatts owned and operated on, under construction. Um, but going into the the, the meat of the, of the of the panel today, um, we're celebrating one year since the um, enactment of the, of the Inflation Reduction Act, and as Danny mentioned, this is a, a landmark uh, legislation. It's the single largest investment in clean energy to date, um, and it's it's over the fir over the first year, it's brought over a hundred billion dollars in private investment. Uh, with that substantial investment comes comes jobs, and we're all we're all here looking for jobs. So, um, you know, there's about 263,000 um, uh, employees in the clean energy space to date, but experts are predicting that to, you know, about rise to about half a million in the next 10 years. Um, 
with the with the investment and the and the jobs that are coming um, from the IRA, we're seeing a, a significant um, manufacturing boom. As as Danny mentioned, the ITC brings certain you know bonuses or adders um, that incentivize domestic content, the use of domestic content on on projects um, or qualifying projects uh, in the states, and we're seeing a significant amount of you know domestic content being brought, uh, domestic content manufacturing being brought to to the states, um, but. With, with the landmark legislation, such a big bill comes, you know, the ups and downs of it. There's been plenty of good and bad um, since the enactment of the IRA, um, and <clears throat> I think the the main thing, um, the main positive from the, from the industry's perspective is is the ITC, the certainty. I want to say certainty lightly, uh, because there is still a lot of you know gaps and holes that we're missing. But with respect to the ITC, it's the certainty that we have a stable ITC for the next uh, eight to 10 years. Um, as Danny mentioned, historically, the ITC has been a, a subject of political debate. Um, there's been no real stableness um, in, in, in its past. It's been subject to you know, stepping down. Um, and it's been a really a, a bargaining chip um, that uh, different political parties have, have used um, to you know, get the, get the you know, piece of legislation that they, they want passed. Um, but with the IRA comes, um, you know, a stable ITC for the next next 10 years. Um, we have we, we see it behind us um, until 2031. It'll be 30 percent, and then it'll be a gradual step down. Um, and in addition to the to the um, the stable ITC, there are different incentives, uh, different you know uh, bonuses that that we like to call. Uh, the first being uh, the domestic content bonus. Um, you know, if we source a, a specific amount. Of our panels and our and our steel, um, you know, in the United States, we can receive a 10% bonus on certain certain projects. Um, energy communities um, as well, we can you know site our project in a certain area of land. Credit to the DOE, they've they've actually come out with a, with a mapping tool that is really easy to plug in a certain address um, to you know determine if a certain project would qualify for the energy communities uh, bonus. In addition to that, the low income economic uh, benefit. Uh, adder and this one's a little different. It's a little, it's, it's different from the, the uh, previous two adders. There's this one is is capped at 1.8 megawatt or gigawatts per year, um, which the industry is a little little divided on. It's it's not really reflective of of the the entire industry's or the magnitude of the industry, I should say. Um, it's but it is you know a significant a significant adder and an opportunity to receive a significant boost on on, on the ITC. Um, but with that, um, with the stable ITC um, and, 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 the, and the different bonuses um, comes, you know, there's, this, there's also the political issue around the ITC. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the, about the politics of, of the IRA. I mean, we are in DC. Um, over the last six months, there's been over two attempts and just recently a third to repeal all or portions of the IRA. Um, first through the, the debt ceiling bill, and um, and second through a Congressional Review Act. Um, thankfully, they both they both did fail, um, so we still have it. Um, but more recently, we're seeing uh, this Speaker Johnson looking to reappropriate funds from from the IRA to um, provide foreign aid. Um, so now is a more important time than ever that we really need to start you know supporting. Uh, not that, not that we haven't been supporting, but you know really. Uh, emphasize our support for the IRA, um, as it is really um, subject to a political debate. Um, and, and yeah, right. No, thank you. Very helpful. Um, and just so folks know, Trevor, the types of projects your company's developing, can you give folks sort of a sense of the size of those projects? So unlike um, Danny, we are on the, uh, the commercial um, and industrial side, as well as the community solar side. So we are, our typical wheelhouse is really between 1 to 10 megawatts. Um, and we're seeing those done on uh, green fields, um, brown fields, landfills, and on, on rooftops uh, as well. So that's really the, the size, the magnitude that we're, um, that we're, that we're dealing in. All right, thank you everyone. My name is Chris Sapino. Uh, I graduated Vermont Law School with an LLM in Environmental Law and an Energy Certificate uh, 10 years ago this year. So it, 
it's great to be back and uh, speaking with the group that helped get me uh, started on my energy career. So thank you to Vermont Law, uh, or sorry, Vermont Law and Graduate School now, uh, to Kevin and the Energy Institute, uh, Danny and the rest of the panelists for, uh, for having me here. I I'm going to take a slightly different perspective and I'll, I'll explain who I am and what I do as part of the, pre as we go along. Uh, but I'm going to take a slightly different perspective because I work for a regional transmission organization. And regional transmission organizations, for those who aren't uh, familiar, uh, what we do is we manage the transmission grid in large portions of the country. And we do not own the transmission facilities, but we operate them, we plan what gets built. We run the uh, we make the rules uh, and develop the rules and try to solve problems with issues like how do you establish an energy market? What do you monetize? What do you not? Uh, and one of the more important uh, uh, areas, or at least more important to me, is how do you actually get the power from where it is to where it needs to be? And that's the generator interconnection process uh, in MISO. So my role. Uh, is I am the managing senior corporate counsel in charge of the group at MISO that works with uh, generator interconnection. And what we do is we develop those rules that enable generation to connect to our grid uh, and to uh, serve customers. And it's not an easy process and it is getting uh, more challenging though it is also a very good place to see uh, to, uh, to see trends emerge and get ahead of uh, where, the, where the utility industry is really going. Uh, I can promise you that my insistence that interconnection is one of the greatest issues facing, uh, facing solar uh, developers has nothing to do with the fact that it's the area that I work in. Uh, it just happens to be uh, my perspective. So let's talk a little bit of history and where we are now uh, traditionally in the Midwest, for a very long period of time, decades, we had vertically integrated utilities and most of our generating fleet was uh, coal powered. Uh, and that's still largely true, but less and less true as we go through. Uh, when you go through the generator interconnection process, what you do now at least in most RTOs is you get studied as part of a group we say in order to, uh, to connect your facility to the uh, transmission system, uh, what, needs to, what do we need to do? What lines do we need to upgrade? It's like putting cars on a bridge. The more you put, the stronger the bridge needs to be. Uh, and these are not trivial costs. We're talking tens, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and it can take years to process these and determine uh, what is, uh, you know, what needs to be done and more importantly, who has to pay for it uh, in order to make sure that the system can support all of the um, new resources that are being built. So as part of that, we are seeing an explosion in uh, the number of uh, requests to connect new generation to the grid. If you look back to 2011, you'll see that we had uh, something in the amount of 12 gigawatts of requests for uh, new generation uh, to the grid. And that steadily has increased um, until after the, um, the IRA, we are now seeing an explosion where in 2021, we had 77 gigawatts of, uh, of new generation uh, now this year, uh, or in 2022, we had 171 gigawatts. That is wonderful, but an absurd amount of generation. N uh, about 70% of it will not actually get built. Uh, trying to f sort out which is the 30% that will get built is a large challenge. And part of the reason we say with confidence that most of this won't get built is historically, it hasn't and also because the, uh, the peak load uh, in the Midwest is something around the uh, area of 130 gigawatts. So if you assumed that there was no generation at all in the Midwest, just cornfields, uh, which you're not far off, but there's a lot of generation, and we were only dealing with, 
what was proposed to being built right now, we would still have enough generation coming in or proposing to come in to serve all load one and a half times over. And that's not accounting for the fact that we already have enough generation to serve uh, load. So th that creates some significant challenges, but also some significant opportunities. One of the biggest trends that you can see if you look at the, if you can see the colors on this chart, is the types of, um, is, is the types of facilities that we were seeing have changed significantly over the years. Where it used to be a lot of um, hydro um, and a little bit of nuclear and natural gas. Uh, if you look at the yellow, which is solar, you can see that in 2022, the bulk of new requests for generation is solar generation. Uh, and that, that's likely to continue, and we owe that in large part to the IRA and also to maturing technologies that enable this to become uh, more prevalent in the grid. So if you look at this, oh, oh, I went a little bit too far. We're seeing these trends, we're, we're, we're expecting these trends to greatly increase between now and 2042. And when you're planning what the grid needs to look like, you need to also look at what's going to be coming into the queue and what's going to get built over the next 20 years. And if you look uh, at what we're expecting by, um, by 2042, we're expecting from where we used to be having maybe 22% now uh, being coal, we're going down to 9%. 34% of what is going to be installed in the Midwest will be wind. Another 24% is going to be solar. And then we have other uh, resources coming in with battery uh, playing a small but increasing role. So what you're looking at here is well over 50% of uh, new generation being built being either solar or wind. And I'll come back to some of the challenges that that faces a little bit, uh, that causes a little bit. But we'll start out by saying, it sounds then like the future is bright. We have a lot of solar, a lot is coming in, a lot is being developed, and that should fuel the transition in the Midwest. Uh, and that largely is true, but there are some headwinds that you know, the group needs to, to consider, and we need to think through what are the solutions to these going to be. And I don't want to take too long, but I do want to briefly touch on some of them. The first is the problem of volume. Uh, we cannot study that uh, 171 gigawatts worth of interconnection requests. And I don't mean it's hard for us or it's a lot of work. It becomes a math problem. Energy has to be consumed uh, at the rate it's produced. That's been a standard truth in the utility industry for years. You, you can't have 171 gigawatts serving 130 uh, gigawatts of load. So the studies don't, the math doesn't work out. So we need to figure out of this 171 gigawatts, what's actually going to be, get built, what is not going to get built, what assumptions can we safely make, and how do we both help more things that are viable to get built, but also chase away kind of the speculative requests? Uh, and that, I'll, I'll talk more on that later. But that's one of the biggest challenges that we have, is if you're developing solar, and we have, uh, and you're part of a queue with 171 gigawatts, you're going to see a lot of delays. You're going to see upgrade costs for the group in the billions of dollars, which may actually end up only being in the tens of millions once everything is sorted out. So that's a significant challenge that we're facing, just given the volume of uh, exuberant developers submitting into the queue. One other big problem that, um, that Danny and Trevor have touched on a little bit is the challenge of actually delay, uh, building all of this. So we have under study currently 242 gigawatts of projects uh, based on the last queue and things that are in the queue before. And 49 gigawatts of approved projects 
that are awaiting construction and they're supposed to be in service within three years. The average delay for each for, among these projects is 650 days, and that's growing. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. There's, you know, they didn't actually get a PPA and they need one and they don't want to start building until they have one. Uh, there's regulatory issues, NIMBYism, uh, you know, problems with getting permits. But one of the largest ones it, right now is supply chain. As Danny mentioned before, it can take now up to two or three, um, two or three times previous, uh, previous um, delay lengths uh, to simply get the transformers that you need, the steel that you need, the solar panels. Part of this is the tail effects of COVID. Uh, part of this is the, um, you know, part of this is 171 gigawatts worth of projects all competing for solar panels and steel. Uh, there are many different causes for it, and I, I won't, at least in my introductory remarks, try to say what the solution is. Uh, and if I knew the solution, I would be out on my yacht right now in the Caribbean. But I will point out that it's a problem, and part of the reason why it's a problem is some of this stuff is just not ever going to get built. But new projects entering are being built used on models assuming that, that it's there and their costs are dependent on this actually being there. So the fact that we have all these delays is creating a lot of uncertainty. And this is beyond just our queue. This is once you've gotten through our queue and you have your agreement. So that's a significant um, uh, headwind that we're facing. One other one, and this may be a little bit less popular, but I, I'll touch on it briefly and last, is capacity. Uh, issues and the, uh, the attributes of generation. When you think of what generation needs to do, you think, well, it just needs to put power over the system in order to turn on light bulbs and run factories. Uh, there's actually a lot more that it needs to be able to do, and we've taken that for granted because there are certain attributes that fossil fuel plants just had. The ability to run at all times of the day the ability to ramp up or down at specific times, fuel supply so that you don't have to worry about something getting interrupted you know, on 15 minutes notice. You know, uh, so one, uh, facilities that will work you know, when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining. It's an unfortunate fact that peak load, the time when people need power the most, does not often occur at the time when the sun is shining most brightly and when facilities are at uh, are, are producing at their highest volume. So what this graph is showing you, and what I think is important, is if you look at the dotted line, it's our projections for load. Uh, how is load going to grow between now and 2041? And if you look at installed capacity, the amount of new generation that's going in, the, the blue line, it looks like, well, we're going to have easily enough to meet that load. But it's not just how much power you're putting in, it's accredited power. Can it actually run during peak times? And certain uh, interruptible facilities like uh, wind and solar can't. There's ways that we can address that, which we can get to maybe in questions. So if you look at what it's actually accredited for, uh, that's the green line. And that is well below uh, our projected load. So if we're relying only on that to serve load, you know, there's going to be lots of, you know, generators turning off in the hospital, uh, rolling blackouts and other issues. We're not going to meet our load. Now, we're thinking about this now, not in 2041, so there's plenty of opportunities to solve this. But it is an important issue, and what it's teaching us is that if we really want the, uh, if we really want to promote the transition uh, to clean energy, if we want to, and not just even promote it, but as a fuel neutral RTO, if we want to be prepared for it, we need to make sure that a lot of these other attributes exist. Uh, things that you wouldn't think about, the ability to maintain the frequency of power is just something that naturally occurred when you're dealing with spinning mass, like conventional uh, generators. But it's not built in to solar or to wind. You can, you can you can design it in such a way that you have grid forming resources that do provide that.
but it's not something that we'd ever thought to monetize before. The market rewards you for, se- uh, with, rewards you for selling power. Maybe we need to start rewarding also, uh, and by rewarding, paying for uh, you know, voltage stability, fuel assurance, availability. And this doesn't necessarily mean, well, paying, for, paying fossil fuels more. It means putting the signals into the market to make sure that new solar, battery, and other resources are properly compensated for providing these necessary services. So when we talk about the challenges of interconnection, we're really thinking about what is it that we can do in our markets and as part of our rules uh, to enable this transition to happen and to ensure that we have grid reliability. MISO, at least, has no dog in this fight. We do not build generation. We do not profit from generation. But we do have a strong interest in keeping the lights on. And so as we go through questions in the panel, that's, that's going to be my focus. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, as an interconnection customer working with MISO, I have, certainly have a lot of questions uh, for you as well. Um, so next we'll move to Michael Gergen. Um, and Michael is Senior Strategic Advisor and Counsel for the Coalition of Green Capital. Great. Hi, hi everybody. And I'll just do a quick, um, what is the Coalition for Green Capital? <laughs> uh, it is a group, it is a nonprofit that was created in 2010. Uh, with the idea of trying to create green banks. And I don't know if people are familiar with the concept of what a green bank is. Um, Basically, the idea, it's much like a development bank, but it's focused on clean energy technologies. Um, We were advocating going back to 2010 for the creation of a national green bank. We actually existed prior to 2010 as an ad hoc group, and we actually wrote part of Waxman Markey, which was going to create the first national green bank within the Department of Energy. But as we all know, Waxman Markey died on the vine. Um, In 2010, we created CGC as a nonprofit. We kind of saw the writing on the wall in terms of there was going to be no movement on the federal side. So we then pivoted and started working with various states and localities to create state and local green banks, starting with Connecticut and New York. Um, We now have green banks in roughly 20 different states. There is a green bank here in Washington, D.C. There is a green bank in Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, We have deployed through the green banks over the last several years probably about five to six billion dollars worth of of capital to support clean energy projects. Now, how does all this relate to IRA? Well, going back to what I had talked about before, you know, we've always been of the mind of trying to create a national green bank. We have, over the years, going back to 2010, occasionally taken a stab at trying to create federal legislation. We've had a number of bills, uh, particularly sort of in the discussion after the 2020 election um, on Build Back Better and the Green New Deal. We were in every different legislative package that there was. Um, We ultimately ended up in IRA as part of the reconciliation. We ended up in a very different place, though, because we went through reconciliation. We ended up being stuck under EPA, um, under what is called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. And I will, oops, there we go. So what is the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is the largest environmental justice component of IRA. It is not the only environmental justice component of IRA, and it is not solely an environmental justice component of IRA, but it is the biggest. It's roughly $27 billion in grant funds that EPA has to basically disperse by the fall of this year. And it's been broken up into three programs, Uh, a National Climate Investment Fund, which is roughly $20 billion that will have two to three grantees that will be basically the thing we always wanted to create, a national green bank. This will be a number of these entities. There is then a clean communities investment accelerator, that's $6 billion in grants that are gonna go through two to seven hubs. And what do I mean by hubs? These are pass-through entities. This is a very novel and new thing in the clean energy finance space. The idea here is these $6 billion in grants are basically going to pass through these hubs to roughly 1,000 community lenders. 
most of these community lenders are existing community lenders. They are people that focus on low income and disadvantaged communities. They generally do a lot of consumer finance. They do a lot of housing finance. They don't do clean energy finance. So this is basically trying to give capital and technical support to basically have a community lender in every community in the country that is there to provide clean energy finance for people who need it. And then last but not least, and this is actually the result of Senator Sanders, um, is the solar for all component of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. And that is $7 billion that are grants targeted primarily for states and local governmental entities. Um, there is some allowance here, and I'll talk about it again in terms of what we CGC are doing because we are actually involved in each one of these. There's a competition at EPA for each one. Applications were just due a few weeks ago. We hope to hear early next year who's going to get money, and hopefully the money will all be dispersed next summer. But the $7 billion is really focused on distributed solar generation in low-income and disadvantaged communities. So it was when you look at the pieces here, the Clean Communities Investment Accelerator is basically to stand up local community lenders. The Solar for All is really more focused on actually deploying the technology, but is, is again focused on solar, DG solar, in disadvantaged communities. And then at the top, we have this National Climate Investment Fund, which is again, we'll have some sort of a national entity. Now, w even within that, oh, let me see. to click with my clicker here, here we go. So what, in terms of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, they have what is called a qualified project. These are the things that the financial assistance made available through these EPA grants can be used to support. Um, given the EJ and community focus of this, what EPA has basically said is we have a core priority projects. And those are those top three here. So that's distributed energy, generation and storage, net zero emission buildings, and zero emissions trans transportation. But they have also left the door open in these competitions, and particularly for the National Climate Investment Fund, because it's not solely targeted at communities, um, on doing larger scale projects. And the idea here in part was, and there was a lot of back and forth um, going from the legislation to the actual EPA rolling out these, the program and the competition. There was a lot of talk about not having any of these other qualified projects and have everything be focused on communities and go through community lenders. Uh, we and other folks, and then I think with the help of McKin McKinsey Sustainability, which put out an impact analysis of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund shortly after it was passed, was to basically show that if you really want to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, you've got to include this category of other qualified projects, these larger scale projects. So what are we doing? So the Coalition for Green Capital, we are applying for all three buckets of money. Um, the first bucket on the NCIF, there's roughly $14 billion available. We are, we are applying for 10 of it. Doesn't mean we'll get all of it, but we're applying for 10 of it. Uh, we, are, we have partnered, and I call these subawardees. They're also called coalition partners in EPA parlance. We have partnered with a number of the existing large green banks and some large community lending entities um, to where we will be basically have them run the program for us in a particular jurisdiction. Uh, we have 18 of these coalition partners. Um, where we have large established green banks, again, I, I can't tell you all the details in terms of what's in the application, but where we have these large existing entities like the New York Green Bank or the Connecticut Green Bank, they're gonna be subawardies. Um, in terms of the community focused, we are seeking, out of that total amount of money available, we're seeking roughly $1.7 billion. And that is for the members of the American Green Bank Consortium, which is an entity that CGC created. Um, it's not a separate corporate entity. It's sort of we do business under that as the American Green Bank Consortium. And this is part of our, again, of standing up the state and local green banks and serving as a clearinghouse. And we've also uh, te teamed up with a community development venture capital alliance. Um, but we're seeking $1.7 billion on those pass-through grants. 
And then finally, for the solar for all, which I mentioned is the primary applicants are supposed to be state entities. What EPA did was if you happen to be in a state, and there are states, um, where the state had no interest in applying for the money, if nobody wanted to show up and apply for the money, you can go in as a private entity, nonprofit, and basically say, I'm applying on behalf of people in your state, and I will you know, stand, help work with these people to stand up. So we've done that in two states, that is North and South Dakota, where we're seeking 100 million in each state. And then what our goal is to, is to basically manage all of this together as part of a large network. Some of our competitors who are applying for some of these funds have very different business models in terms of what we do. They don't want to build a network. Um, that is our goal is to build a network. So what are we going to do with the funds of all this money, in particular of the $10 billion on the National Climate Investment Fund? Because we have the subawardees, our intention is to basically take 75% of the money and give it to them for them to then go operate in those jurisdictions. We will keep 25% of the money on our books, which we will then use for larger scale projects. And uh, what I've done here is at the bottom, I've listed our 18 coalition partners, with small type. So in the application for the <coughs> NCIF, EPA asked us to come in, not only with partners, but also pipeline. And we went through a process working with our, with our local and state partners as well as doing our own RFI of trying to go find pipeline. We also started going and talking to a lot of large, in particular national developers and large national retailers who didn't want to go through the brain damage of having to go talk to our local partners, wanted to talk to somebody at the national level to develop pipeline. We, for sort of a day one pipeline, and again, this is a notional pipeline and to the point that was made early in the panel, you have to go back and revisit the pipeline because the, the assumptions that were made when we were developing the pipeline three and four months ago, macroeconomic conditions have changed. There are things in that pipeline that probably don't work anymore. There may be things that will work better. But we were oversubscribed. We're seeking $10 billion. We came in with a pipeline day one, $30 billion. Um, and I'll, I'll walk through a little bit about what that pipeline means. And then one of their three program objectives for the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, and this is why I want to speak to, the, to this, is one is to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and other forms of air pollution. The other is to sort of have the benefits of clean energy be extended to every community in the country. And the third, and to us one of the most important, and it is, it is the Green Bank model, is mobilize private capital. What we have always traditionally done with the green banks is tried to use as little public money as we possibly can, because that's where our funds come from. Use as little public money as possible on the capital stack for a project to make a project happen that wouldn't have otherwise happened. So it has to be additional. We want to be catalytic in what we do, and we want to unlock basically private capital investment. And so as we look at this in terms of our ability to catalyze private capital investment, over time, we see the ability to get to very high leverage numbers uh, or mobilization ratios or however you want to define that. And some of the particular things we're looking at, um, for example, one area that's very interesting to us, um, particularly in the IRA context, is insurance. And for example, insurance products for some of the bonus credits. Right now, there are a lot of the mainstream insurers who we're talking to who are very uncomfortable offering insurance products. We may have to go provide some kind of a reinsurance product to backstop them. Um, but those are the kind of things as green banks we've always done and like to do because that, that thing of providing insurance and credit enhancements, if you're careful and you manage your reserves carefully, um, you, can, you can support a lot of private capital investment with not a lot of public money. But sort of the overall thing is here, we showed over, because EPA has kind of defined the program as having a seven year life. We think we can turn the money over three times in seven years that we get, and we'll only end up with basically $157 billion in cumulative investment off of an initial investment of $10 billion of public funds. So that's roughly a 15 to one. And like some of the things we're looking at on the insurance side, the leverage numbers are like 30 to one. So what are going to be the outcomes 
I had mentioned before that McKinsey Sustainability did a, did a preliminary analysis of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Using their same analytic tools, we, we applied those to our notional pipeline. And here's what we came up with in terms of emissions reductions uh, for greenhouse gases as well as other, other forms of air pollution. Headline of this is if you look at the 2030 number, um, that 233 million tons of emissions avoided or reduced is about 5% of the overall administration goal to hit by 2030. So we're a piece. We're not the whole. We're just a piece. But we think we're an important piece. And again, we, we with this, the EJ focus here, we also think we can generate a lot of jobs, lots of cost savings, particularly in low-income and disadvantaged communities in terms of the energy burden faced by households and businesses in those communities, and then health benefits. Um, and on the health benefits, as we've been digging into it, that to me has been probably one of the most fascinating things. And I will give you an example. We've been working on a project here in DC, um, working with the, with the uh, Children's Hospital and some other folks we've been able to identify basically like childhood asthma, where is it in DC? It's actually in a thousand buildings in DC. Almost all of the childhood asthma in DC comes from the same places over time in the same communities. And if you could figure out targeted ways to address those, you can have huge impacts. So now I'm gonna pivot <laughs> to Christopher's subject. Because this is the other, right? And this is the why we wanted to do the other categories. They matter from an emissions reduction standpoint. One of the things that we, we are very interested in, and part of this is my own background. I was in big law for, for 30 years. I joined CGC full time this past spring. And I was a, a project finance energy regulatory attorney in a big law firm. Um, the interconnection and transmission, and, I, and I've represented lots of independent transmission developers. I negotiated the uh, Clean Lines Participation Agreement with DOE for that project that was going to go from Texas to Tennessee. Um, we need a lot more of this stuff. We need a lot more transmission. We need a lot of high voltage transmission to achieve the transition. This is one of the gaping holes in IRA. And you know, I and, and some of my clients, we push very hard, for example, to try to get some kind of an ITC for high voltage transmission. We failed. We tried to get significant financing for a grid deployment authority, a DOE, something like on the order of $100 billion. We failed at that as well. We got some money. There are a couple of programs that DOE has, but they don't have much more than about $8 billion. And as you probably saw, they already announced for their transmission facilitation program where they have roughly three and a half. It's enough to support three projects. That's it. Um, and it doesn't even touch interconnection. <laughs> we are very interested in that as well. And um, again, this, if we don't do the transmission, don't do the transmission. And I assume everybody has seen that this is from uh, repeat Princeton net zero. They put out a wonderful <laughs> report after IRA had passed, but they waited a month to basically say, oh, by the way, <laughs> all that wonderful stuff you think you're gonna achieve through IRA, if you actually don't increase the build out of high voltage transmission at a pace that we've only seen sort of one time in the history of the US, you're not even gonna get close. You're not even gonna get close. So now I'm going to pivot to, to exactly into the, the, the interconnection issue, which I see as part of what I call here the, the tragedy of the transmission commons, which is a phrase that was crafted by the DC circuit um, in reviewing a FERC order. Um, I believe it was FERC order 1000. Um, but basically the idea of this is what transmission, the big bugaboo is cost allocation. Permitting is hard. I've, I've worked on you know, big long distance, permitting's hard, cost allocation's much harder. And, and it's the who's gonna pay and for what, and then what benefits are they getting in terms of what they're paying for. Makes it very difficult, and we again, for the inter-regional projects, we've seen it because we have what you know, we generally refer to as the chicken and egg problem between 
the renewable resource and the transmission to get that renewable generation to a load center or a market. Sort of, who, who, go for, who goes first? And you have to have commitments. Well, the same logic, in a way, applies to interconnection, the way that we do interconnections. Um, and as Chris mentioned, you know, most people don't do serial interconnection anymore. We do it in clusters. But even in the cluster approach, you, you have this very like, uh, interesting game that you play where you sort of like figure out what you think the costs are going to be and you look at it, like with the project, how much I'm going to pay for interconnect re relative to the capex for my project. And there is a number beyond which people just won't build a project. Um, and you end up dropping out of the cluster and then that creates problems for all the other people in the cluster. So you end up, it doesn't solve the problem. Um, part of this is the investment and the upgrades are lumpy. And typically what happens is the people in that cluster, or if it's a serial project interconnecting, they pay the full cost. In very few regions in the US can you monetize and recover that cost if you're a generator. You just pay it and you're done. And it gets rolled in if you have a PPA price or whatever you're selling the market, you just gotta recover it. That creates a problem for people. And so I know that, uh, you know, for Commissioner Clements had talked last year about the idea of coming up with some kind of a, a levelized charge and sort of thinking about that from this standpoint that makes some sense. What we're thinking is we might be willing to, and we would bring in private capital to make this happen. We won't be the biggest source of capital. We might be a credit enhancement backstopping it. But basically to have people who would be willing to, and we've talked to capital investors, they'd be happy to do this, to pay forward for network upgrades as long as they know they're gonna get paid back by the generators when they interconnect. So what we've thought about here is we can provide financing solutions, the National Green Bank sort of makes steps. It fits in with our mission because again, we are trying to maximize reductions of greenhouse gases given every dollar of public funds we're gonna get. And our next steps, which we've already been doing, I've been actually in discussions with some of your colleagues, been folk, talking to folks at SPP and Cal ISO as well, about are there ways that we can, without doing too much damage to the existing processes. Again, this is a political problem of cost allocation. I'm not trying to solve it, because <laughs> I don't think I can. And I don't think there's any appetite right now at FERC to solve that problem. But we think we can help. And again, I kind of, it's a Band-Aid. It is a Band-Aid, what we're proposing, but it is a way that I think we could, working with existing RTOs and ISOs, using their 205 filing rights, and you will understand that, right, why that's important, that there may be ways we can do this and help. And just, again, we're just trying to accelerate, trying to make things happen that wouldn't happen otherwise, and trying to make them happen faster. Thank you. Well, in fact, your colleagues had told me, you know, if, if we had been around two years ago, we probably would be part of that process and providing some kind of capital support. Just a couple questions for me and then want to open it up to other folks. But what you highlighted, I think, is a problem we see across the industry. It's not a solar specific issue, but I'll just speak from the solar perspective is um, these lumpy and costly um, upgrades required by an interconnection customer. So the model is generator pays. Uh, we get into this queue, there's 171 gigawatts in the MISO queue. 70% of those projects are gonna um, withdraw at some point through the process. How do we create a system that accurately um, accounts for the upgrades that are actually required? And then how do we push those costs on interconnection customers in a way that facilitates development? I think it's one of the big challenges we see. Um, so I'm very interested in this idea of um, you know, some sort of capital investment at the outset to pay for these lumpy costs um, that then they're sort of, um, you know, get a return on the investment. I guess I'm interested in your thoughts, and Chris had mentioned your thoughts on this as well. You know, there are some states, as you mentioned, that through the sort of transmission owner tariffs, they reimburse an interconnection customer for those network upgrade costs. So if the generator uh, comes online and brings that project online and they have a you know, PPA for at least one year with a, a network customer, those costs are reimbursed, which really changes the game from a um, developer's perspective of what it costs to play in that market and what price can we offer you know, our power to. Those costs are being passed to ratepayers in other ways, of course. Um, so I guess my question is, 
in this sort of um, proposal where you have sort of capital investment, how do you see that playing in markets where there is reimbursable network upgrade costs and or should we push to move to a system where all network upgrade costs are reimbursed? Well, I think the, so if you talk to people in the span, this is why I said I think what we're proposing is a Band-Aid solution. The people that in our group that have sort of been working on this, the first best solution would be to socialize the cost of network upgrades. We all love Texas. <laughs> and not all of Texas, but at least this part of Texas in terms of if you're trying to interconnect to generate, we love Texas. Um, and we love the CREZ projects too. I mean, again, it's just the interesting, you know, you socialize the cost, the benefits are widely spread. Again, what we're trying to accomplish through the transition. Um, I, I would think that, I don't think that that is a realistic possibility. And again, this is, there is no appetite at FERC to do that. And I think most of the states that haven't already done it, I don't think there's a lot of appetite to do it either. Um, so this is why I think our solution is at least what we're trying to do is smooth out the lumpiness so that when people interconnect, it, you're, if you're the unfortunate one or the unfortunate cluster, you're not the ones hit with all the costs. You're, the other people are going to share on those costs too. So it just, it's a little more predictable. It does not solve for the problem Chris mentioned in terms of you just got way too much stuff in the queue to study it. There are things you could do. I actually wrote, a, I wrote an academic paper. It got published like 15 years ago uh, when we were doing this in the gas. This, this is not a new problem. We went through this problem in the early 2000s with gas. Not in every market, but I went through this in California. This was a mess. We had... You know, 80 gigawatts in the, in the queue for a 40 gigawatt system. And it was all, almost all of it was gas. And it wasn't going to get built. And so what do you do? Well, I, what I proposed were positional auctions. The people who hated it, the, the Caliso people, loved me, called me up and said, oh, that's a great article. All of my generator clients called me up and complained. Because they all think they have the secret <laughs> sauce, right? We got the project, we know, we figure out the right, why should I do something, right, that's going to put me at a disadvantage because I'm better than everybody else at figuring out how to game the queue? It's certainly the developer mindset. Um, I can speak from experience. Um, should we leave some time for other folks? I, I have other questions. Okay. Um, I guess, Chris, one question for you. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, 70% of projects ultimately withdraw from the, the MISO process. You know, I think one of the challenges we see from the industry side is you get in the queue, and because we are the developer with the secret sauce, you know, we're going to take our projects forward. But we have this issue that even as we go through the different phases of, for example, the MISO process, those numbers are changing on us constantly based on the actions of other interconnection customers um, and other um, folks in the queue. And that creates a lot of uncertainty for us, right? So even if we get DPP, what, the first study back, it says network upgrades are X, interconnection facilities are Y. That can change, like, even after a GIA is executed. What would be your advice to um, an interconnection customer, a developer, a, a lender on how we should be thinking about those risks? Um, and what is MISO sort of doing to help manage those through the process? Thank you. That's an, that's an excellent question. I wish there was an easy answer. Uh, there's, there's not that much that I can tell an individual utility or an individual developer that they can do besides not submit junk projects. One of the biggest problems that we see is developers that know that they want to build something but don't know exactly what will submit five or six requests. And this problem of the, 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 this problem of the, of the uncertain costs is imagine what kind of transmission you would need to build to support 171 gigawatts. You're, you're talking t uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. So everyone gets their share of that and gets chased out of the queue. In reality, if we could find a way to say, well, probably about 10 gigawatts of that is going to get built and assign the costs uh, and give people clear price signals, here's what it's going to cost you based on what is actually going to be built, uh, that would help a lot. It would be one of the one of the more interesting ways that we could solve it. And it's something that MISO is actively working on. In fact, we have a filing going in tomorrow to do exactly that. Um, one of the things that we're trying that we are going to do is we are going to put a cap on how much we will study at once. And it's based on how much can we actually study and still get valid assumptions. 
uh, without you know, assuming you know, that we turn off every generator in the footprint and other things that won't happen. So it, the other part of that that we're filing is if we can, uh, it, we, we want to raise barriers to entry not to prevent viable projects, but to chase out the projects that aren't viable. Because what one developer does, as you noted, Danny, impacts what everybody else does. Um, and so if we you know, charge higher fees to get in, if we say, if you withdraw from the queue, you're, go you're not going to get some of your money back, what we really want, the ideal thing we would see in MISO is developers who thought about okay, this is the project that I want to build. I've talked to the landowner. I know that I can actually build this as long as the upgrade costs are reasonable and this is legitimate. As opposed to developers who say, I know I want to build something and I want to go chase these PPAs, so let me throw out five or six requests. When you do that, everybody else's costs go up and then everybody leaves the queue and it becomes a very large problem. So coming up with high enough barriers to stop speculation without chasing out actual legitimate projects is one big thing that we can do. And also putting in requirements that tend to target those projects that are legitimate. Do you actually own the site where you plan on building? You know, that's one of the things that we're working on and we're going to file. Um, another big thing is you know, the socialization element. We actually do have a proposal, and the DOE did fund it to the tune of about $400, uh, $400 million, and it's called our Joint Targeted Interconnection Queue. And I could spend an hour talking about this, but I'll see if I can give it to you in 30 seconds. Um, one of the big problems facing interconnection customers is lumpiness. Uh, a generator pays for its impacts. So if a bridge can hold 10,000 pounds, then you know, car, uh, cars you know, that weigh 999 pounds pay nothing to cross that bridge. But unlucky car 1,000 pays for everything. But they don't pay to build a much better bridge. They pay only to make that bridge strong enough to support just their car. So rather than having, you know, saying, well, let's all just chip in to build a much bigger bridge, and then the next 30 people can cross it without having to rebuild it again, uh, that is one of the, that, that, that is one of the, uh, the main goals and one of the things that you could try to achieve through socialization. So and it, one of the initiatives that I'm leading with uh, one of our major uh, SEAMS partners, the Southwest Power Pool, is called the Joint Targeted Interconnection Queue. And what we are doing there is we are saying, what are some big trunk lines? Not little itty bitty upgrades for generators, but big trunk lines that can unlock generation for the next 10, 15 years. And we're gonna build them. And we're going to have our transmission owners front some of that money and then have a standard charge that goes to generators over the, um, that enter over the next few years. Uh, and this idea has been wildly popular and it, we are going to file it but there are a lot of challenges to it. And it comes down to cost allocation. Nobody wants to be stuck with a bill. What if the generators don't show up? What if, I get, I don't, what if I wait two years and I get a free pass? So it's a very hard and a very thorny problem. But while the $1.4 billion JTIQ proposal uh, you know, is it's an experimental approach, and if it works, when we've said this publicly, we're going to do it with PJM. We're going to do it everywhere else that we can do. And we could really set up a model where ultimately the generators pay. But in order to do that and to make it work, generators need to know up front how much are they going to pay. And it's a, it's, it's a multiplication issue, or it's a division issue, actually. How many people are actually going to get through the queue and end up paying? Because if 10 people share in, five, in $2 billion, that looks a lot different than if it's 100. So those are some of the things that we can and are doing and uh, will continue to try to do. Thanks, Chris. Um, switching gears a little bit away from the interconnection transmission side, Trevor, a question for you. You know, I think an important policy question that we are seeing play out across the U.S. is this question of who should have jurisdiction over siting renewable energy projects. Um, this is dealt with um, differently state by state. Trevor, I was wondering if you have a view on uh, how projects should be sited. Yeah, no, this is a very complex issue um, that I don't think really, there isn't really a silver bullet for this, honestly. 
you know, it's done in different states, um, but there's, you know, various factors that, that have succeeded and, and failed and such. Um, I think we need to find a balance between, you know, understanding the local community's interests when we cite, you know, DG and community solar uh, projects, while also um, understanding the, the state and regional um, goals and energy energy needs of that community. Um, while that, you know, in theory, um, you know, would be great, uh, it often doesn't really happen in practice. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a very complex issue. And to go back to the interconnection point, um, it's, it's something that's, you know, it's plaguing the market. We're, we're seeing a bunch of states, you know, opening programs, um, you know, opening net metering programs, community solar programs. But if, we're, if we can't really permit the projects and we can't interconnect to the grid, we're not really going to get anywhere. Um, so it really goes back down to who, you know, authorizes these projects to go through and, you know, how we can come up with, you know, a synchronous process that doesn't really affect the local communities while also balancing the interests of the, of the state of the state needs. Yeah, I think an interesting um, example of this is, or one proposed solution is sort of what uh, the state of Wisconsin does, where projects over 100 megawatts, I think very similar in Minnesota, it's maybe 50 megawatts, go up to the state commission. Those projects are deemed of you know state public policy, um, state public power goals, and so they're cited by the state jurisdiction. Whereas projects sub those threshold amounts are cited through the local communities, whether it's towns or counties. Um, and that's a nice, it presents an interesting and nice balance of what sort of projects remain in the community cited by the, the planning commissions uh, versus which ones are you know, of such import or such complexity that it actually makes sense to, to elevate them to the state siting commission. Um, and you know, these policy questions are playing out. Michigan has a bill proposed right now um, to, to bring siting to the state commission for projects over uh, 50 megawatts as well. So I think we'll continue to see this play out. But I think you're right. In any process, local input is really important. So figuring out what is the role of a local community in that state level process, if that's direction's going, um, is key to make sure that we're, we're bringing in the host community's viewpoints as well. Um, with that, do any folks in the audience have any questions? I have a question. Uh, uh, Michael, I, I, I uh, oh, thank you. Sure. I, I appreciate your um, uh, presentation. And um, about, and I'm thinking about siting as well as the operation of these facilities. And it just so happened that I was reading about uh, the settlement that was reached by the Attorney General of the District of Columbia against Pepco. And it's for $57 million. And it uh, was touted as an environmental justice issue because PEPCO uh, uh, contaminated the Anacostia River. Ward 7 and 8, predominantly minority and low-income communities. Uh, the river has dioxin, um, so many uh, uh, things in it. With all of this activity that's going on with the Inflation Reduction Act and all this, all of the stuff that you talked about. How is it that these communities will be protected <coughs> in the future when they have been screwed for S hundreds of years? Super good question. And okay. environmental justice is concerned about low-income and minority communities being disproportionately exposed to environmental harms and risk yep. in the past. What about the future? What so, does it look so, like? Super good question. And I will tell you again, part of the community focus on the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund and the way we've responded to it is we actually have an environmental justice advisory board. Uh, we've had one s since IRA was passed largely. And it had a tremendous input in terms of our application. But in terms of our governance structure, the way we're going to build this out is when we actually finance anything, there's going to be community engagement process as part of the origination process. And we're going to have community advisory boards. And we're going to have, we're basically going to have a governance structure in every EPA region, and there are 10 of those. We're going to have an advisory board in each region. And that's then going to be made up of local community advisory boards speaking up to the region, which will then speak to the national. And we also, again, part of whenever we're doing a project from an origination in a reporting standpoint, we're going to develop the infrastructure and the tools to actually monitor, like we're going to look at what 
outputs did we generate in that community and what outcomes. But getting to that process, to your point, is we're not even going to do those things without having gone through a community engagement process in the first place. We're just not going to go do stuff in a community that doesn't want us to be there or doesn't want a project to be there. We're going to go and try to you know, work with people to explain to them why a particular type of project makes sense in that community. But it's got to work for the community. The project has to. Well, uh, Danny, Trevor, Christopher, Michael, I can really hear the passion uh, in your voices and what you do. It's, it's amazing to hear it. Thank you for sharing your experiences about uh, this uh, subject matter and uh, sharing a little bit about your career tra trajectories as well. It's, uh, it, it's a great panel. Thank you.